I'm presuming that's my cue. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Sarah Jane Mee from Sky, and I'm delighted to be here this morning um, to speak to the controller of Channel 5, Ben Fro. Now, in my script here, it says, uh, this is what we hope is going to be the best controller session of the festival. We know it is going to be the best. I, I didn't say that. <laughs> Don't put his mic in I would yet. Never Don't put his that. mic in yet. I would never presume that. We know because when we ask Ben Fro questions, we get honest answers, which is why you've all got up early this morning, battled the hangovers and got here on time. So thank you very much for that. Uh, if you would like to ask Ben a question yourself, uh, please use the festival app. Uh, they're all going to come up on my screen. And at the end, uh, if we have some time, we'll go through some of those for you. Um, and if you've ever wondered who Ben Fro actually is. Oh, sorry. I keep saying Ben Fro because it's I equate you with fashion. So I always think of Fro as in front row. I'll take that. <laughs> I'll take that. And I've been corrected so many times, but I still do it. it took me a long time to work out what to wear today. So uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Ben Frau, uh, if you've ever wondered who he is and what makes him tick, he is very much Channel 5. He always talks about Channel 5 as being an extension of himself. Um, and if you want to know how to pitch to Channel 5 and how he makes a commission, what will work for him, you've come to the right place because that's what we're going to find out today. He's already started talking. He might blush from some of the things that I'm going to say because he is one of the most instinctive ideas men in the business, renowned for telling it like it is. Um, and he's responsible for masterminding a remarkable turnaround for Channel 5, uh, where they've outperformed many of their terrestrial rivals. And if you look at some of the figures, uh, the Channel 5 family had a 6% growth in all viewers this year and a 6% rise in up market audiences. And if you look at its reputation with indies, critics and viewers, um, it's getting better and better. So what has fueled this change? That's what we're going to be talking to Ben about today. Um, but before we get to talk to Ben, let's have a look back at what's been a transformative 12 months for Channel 5. Being seen like in New Zealand, a couple what? of women in the shed. Wow, that's incredible. To be able to do what you want and do it here is just phenomenal. What qualifies us out of the ordinary? We're like a, a man with a bomb. My God! Now I can do PE if I have the right stuff. If they think that, then they think we're monsters. Please, God, please. Um, Long gone past, stabbing time. Now we're straight shooting people. I only ever cheated on you the one. I only cheated once. Sex is sex, please my pleasure. I'm chuffing bare girls, aren't I? Yorkshire's dales and moors. This is the story of the wildlife that lives there. Once Henry set his mind on having something, he was prepared to do absolutely anything to get it. Stop that crying! If you want to be in the army, you need to act like it, don't you? It really is a treasure. I was cracking up. These glasses, these windows in my head and they're breaking. It reminds me of being back at school, really. So I never went to no school like this. It's where the people I love live and it's where I, I want to be. That's just a taste of what Channel 5 have been putting to air over the past 12 months. A lot of Jane McDonald in there at your personal request, I'm sure. Um, but Ben Frau, what has been the biggest change that you've made at Channel 5 over the last 12 months? Uh, probably uh, the, 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 the concentrated move into uh, attracting up market viewers. Mm. Last year, I seem to remember, we were really struggling with up markets. We had a great year for 1634s, but we were... You know, we still couldn't get those up market sort of BBC Two, BBC Four viewers to the channel. That has really changed this year. And it's everything. It's interesting. It doesn't have to be history. A lot of it is history. Elizabeth, uh, Six Eyes of Henry VIII. Uh, it's things like barging, celebrities going barging. Jane MacDonald is, is very up market. And shows like Rich House, Poor House, which are up market and young. They're, they're particularly sort of valuable properties for us. So I think that that's, that's probably the biggest shift, that suddenly those, those broadsheets and those... 
those people with, with you know, reputations are, are saying nice things about us and recognising what we're trying to do. Mm. And you've talked about changing the tone and the mood of the channel as well and moving away from darker content. Do you think you've managed to do that? I think that's, that's been a, a key to our success. I think that uh, I think we've always been very good at, you know, I said yesterday in the leaders' debate, I, th I feel we're like, we're like a northern channel. I've, al I've always thought about the regions. When everything we commission, we think about who our viewer is, and they are never in London. Um, I mean, we we'll, we'll have them in London, but I, th I imagine them being up, up, up north. And um, uh, I, I think for about four months before Brexit, I was... I just woke up and I just go, we've just got to change the channel. We've just be, got to be life-affirming and feel-good and celebratory. And again, it's things like, you know, Jane MacDonald and Rich House, Poor House that have really proved I was right to, to, to change that direction. Um, we'd had a lot of success with some of our darker programming, and I will always be very grateful for what it, it, it helped us achieve. But we are having even more success with our feel-good stuff, and it has much more longevity. Mm. And when you picture somebody at home watching Channel 5, what do they look like? What do they want? Well, I don't know why I always feel that. I always feel they've been, they live in Middlesbrough, and I don't even know where Middlesbrough <laughs> is. Anyway, but, you know, I tell you... I tell Anyone you, want I mean, to pitch a geography programme? <laughs> I think you've got to understand your viewer. And for me, it is an older lady mm -hmm. and her granddaughter watching television together. And, you know, when we talked about Blind Date, I was very, very much um, aware that a lot of people would want to come to Blind Date for nostalgic reasons, but we also had to introduce it to a new generation. So we wanted to modernise it and have, um, you know, LGBT contestants um, and, and, and make it feel fresh and modern. But I didn't want to frighten the horses and I didn't want to frighten the woman who might be wanting to watch it for nostalgic reasons. Mm -hmm. And we had to play that show quite carefully in terms of reassuring the viewer it was blind dated, they knew it, and then we could introduce the diversity that I feel that we should be having on a show like that. So I try and think, how, how can we make them want to watch the programme? What is going to entice them in? Why are they going to stay with it? Why would they come back next week? What is in it for them? How can we pitch it so that they are not alienated by it or frightened by it or intimidated by it? You know, Secrets of the National Trust, when that was pitched to me, I said, that's not a Channel 5 programme, that's a BBC programme. But then we sat and talked about it, and I thought, actually, if you put Alan Titchmarsh on it, who is from ITV, that will... You know, the, our, our viewers who might be intimidated by the National Trust or think, oh, that's for posh people or that's for rich people, would go, well, hang on a minute, Alan Titchmarsh He's is doing it. He's more approachable, doesn't he? He's it? more approachable, yeah. he's accessible, he's giving us permission, therefore it must be for us too. Yeah. And I think that you can take some sort of quite serious subjects and make them much more accessible for the Channel 5 viewer that doesn't want to work that hard, frankly. <laughs> well, that's how you understand your viewers, but to understand the channel and what you want, um, we need to know more about your personality because you're very much making a lot of the decisions of what goes to air on Channel 5, you really are hands-on. Now, I think you're brave and a bit crazy to have agreed to do this. I haven't seen this. <laughs> um, ben has agreed to do an in-therapy session, a chance for you all to really understand him and literally get inside his head. It's amazing that this was done before your new series comes out, In Solitary, yeah. where, everybody sits well, in, <laughs> where everybody sits in a white room for well, however long they can. Well, this year we were all given the freedom to do what we liked with these controller sessions. And, and Jonathan, who, who, Jonathan Stadden, who makes GPs for us, amongst other things, uh, very kindly agreed to produce it. And I said, look, all that matters is you in the audience. All that matters is helping you understand how to get work at Channel 5. You've got to understand me. You want to know about our schedule. You want to be able to see the commissioners. And you want to come away from this going, this is what it's like to work with Channel 5. This is what Ben Frow is like to work with. This is what the commissioners are like. This is what the schedule needs. So the thinking behind me going into therapy, and I haven't seen this. I'm quite interested to see what happened, actually, uh, is, and I never know the questions I'm going to be asked because I like to freewheel. Um, the point was, you know, can you understand me better than I can understand myself? And... Um, <laughs> How will that help you get commissions from Channel 5? OK, ladies and gentlemen, this is Ben Frau in therapy. Come on in. So, before we get going, I'd just like you to check in with how you're feeling. Feeling very, very slightly butterfly -y. It's very brave. Really? I think it's very brave for anyone to come into therapy. How do you feel about yourself? I like myself. I think I'm a good person. I think I'm a creative person. I think I'm a good boss. But how do you feel about yourself? I don't really feel feelings in that way. I don't have feelings about Ben. Or I kind of go, ooh, boring, or 
shy or... Would you say you are shy? I'm very shy. I, I can feel that. I'm very shy in, in, in an very... environment that I'm not not um, au fait with or, or uh, comfortable with. I, that's why I never go to parties. I never go to... I hate going to any function where I'm sitting next to people I don't know. Yeah. Um, I could never walk into a room and introduce myself. I find it mortified. I mean, absolutely mortified. Paralyzing. I was sent to a choir school, St Paul's Cathedral Choir School, when I was eight. All boys school. I saw my parents once every two weeks for tea. I loathed every single day in that school. I quite liked dressing up in the chorister's, you know, uniform, and I liked the singing, but um, I wasn't academic. I think being away from home makes you emotionally uh, very dry. I mean, deep in my core, I'm a very emotional person. My partner always says, mm. you've got no emotion. I actually cry incredibly easily, but I would never show it. Yeah. But, because I wasn't academic, I couldn't go to a posh school like all my friends, or non-friends, um, I went to the local comprehensive. And I was just teased. I mean, just te jeered because I spoke posh. And I remember being in the, pro in the playground thinking, okay, there's two ways to do this. I can either put on a Cockney accent or whatever accent it was being, and merge in, or I stick to my guns here and I just sort of see this through. By the sixth form, I was doing all the assemblies. I wore pink from head to toe. I was very flamboyant. And the wonderful headmaster there, you know, took me out of metalwork and rugby and said, why don't you do theatre design and why don't you do embroidery and why don't you do art and why don't you do these things? So he really, amazing man, nurtured my creativity. Um, and I am an awful lot, really. And that sort of gave me a lot of confidence. Of just, I am who I am. I do what I do. I don't like to conform. I'm non-political. What do you mean by political? Well, in play, you know, schmoozing the right people, right. Yeah. getting on the right boards, yeah. sitting on the right juries, you know, being a member of this, that and the other, da -da -da -da, yeah. going to this, that and the other event. You know, I really can't be asked about it. You know, I believe in putting my head down, doing a good job. And, and I kind of like the fact that I don't do it like everybody else does it, but I still get good results. I would never put myself into a situation where I thought I could be rejected, ever. Because the risk is too high. Yeah, because they might not want to talk to me, or I, you know, I had to get this terrible dinner. He, or everybody was famous there. I mean, everybody else would have loved it. Like 30 people around one dining table. They were all little clumps, chat, chat, chatting. And I was all alone in an absolute cold sweat, pretending mm. to look at the architecture and pretending to read the books, just going, I just do not want to be here. Mm. Because none of them were going, hello, how are you? Mm. They were welcoming me in. And I sure as hell wasn't brave enough to go and go, hello, I'm Ben from Channel 5, because they might go, who gives a fuck about you? Um, it was. It was one of the worst nights of my life. Um, and I, I, Can you just take a breath on that? Because it makes me think about you being in any of those social groups, perhaps from very young, where you were on your own with potential negative feeling around you and that sense of threat. Mm. And I wonder if you've carried that with you. Possibly from the choir school. Which because is like in that moment, that little boy is uh, anticipating rejection and your safest mm. way was to get hold of the Ben that was going to be humiliated and ridiculed, pop him somewhere safe, shut the door and go out mm. and just go, come on, I'm going to mm. overcome this. So that by the sixth form, you're dressed head to turn pink and taking mm. assemblies. Mm. Did you at any point go back and collect him? No. And I think that- I think he's still there. Yeah, I do. And I think that when you're standing in the, that place like the dinner with the great and good, mm. even the thought that you go up to someone and say, I'm Ben from Channel 5, um, isn't really the Ben that's going to capture them. It's to go up to them and say, hi, I'm Ben Frau, because I am good enough. Mm. I know I'm good enough. Mm. In a way, I try to use the... The, the fact that I'm in the underdog and I'm, you know, I'm not in the right levels of society and I'm not amongst the great and the good, I use it to kind of go, I'll show you yes, that I can I do that. as well, if not better than any of you, but what I would without suggest, doing it in the, in the traditional way. I get that. But what become fuel. But I wonder if there's anything about your delivery yes. when you are sitting in yes, a group of I'm people sure or people that you perceive to yeah. be the underdog around yeah. that means that you set yourself up to fail. Totally. 
And yes, if we were. Yes, it reinforces to, my, my perception that which everybody looks down their nose at me, which is Which like enables fantastic. you to stay in the underdog and then to fight Completely. the system. Completely. And I would I'm love, sure you're right. But I would love to. But you know, but I go into a room and you can you read a room. I mean, I always say before I do a presentation or I'm having to give a speech or you have to be interviewed or whatever it is, you know, and I always go, and one goes, oh, you need to do this, this, that, and the other. And I go, read the room. Mm. Who's laughing? Who's not laughing? You know, am I going to spread, you know, it's the worst thing in the world for me is when I do control decisions is people laugh. Because if they laugh, I'll give them more. And I, I get more and more and more and more open. You know, if you get no reaction, just go, okay, we'll keep this short. Clearly nobody's interested in this. Let's just get out of this room as soon as possible. So I'm sure that subconsciously I'm in that room going, you all look down your nose at me. I'm going to re-emphasize that point, even though it's only subconscious. I will leave this room going, it's as bad as I ever thought it was. You still look down your nose at me. I still feel like the underdog. I'm still going to prove that I'm better, as, as good as you are. Which blah, 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 means blah, that blah, they can't way, reject blah, blah. you. I know there are ways of really addressing that so it doesn't hurt anymore. Because I wonder if you are ambitious, is the world your oyster or is part of that world not available to you because you can't or won't play those games? Possibly, and I, I am very aware that there is parts of the world and places where I will not be able to go because I won't put myself out there. And I kind of just take that on the chin. Am I ambitious? Can we just stay with the take that on the chin? Yeah. So I'm wondering that, that, that this wounding, if you like, which causes this compromise, I want to call it a handicap yet, but now. I think it probably is a handicap. I think okay. it's a handicap. If I it's, think a it's a handicap, handicap. Okay, if it's a handicap now, um, the wounding probably happened before you were fully into your frontal cortex, before you were fully responsible for your life. Mm. And for me, it seems sad that that should just be a fait accompli. When my experience is that you can, at 55, go back, reparent that part of yourself and limit the impact of the original wounding on your today. Okay. What's that feeling? What is that? I don't know, that's, well, that's a nervous twitch, isn't it? That's kind of I like, ooh, we're in a slightly awkward area now. When you start talking about this kind of thing, it makes you slightly kind of go, oh, God, makes it's, it's slightly like me. Slightly, oh, I'm slightly uncomfortable grounding. It's getting a bit emotional now. Sometimes I wish I could have a bit more fun. Sometimes I wish I was a bit, a bit less goody two-shoes, a little less reliable. I really But it's hear, just not in my nature. Well, it's not in your priming. It may be in your nature because I hear a yearning for it. I hear an appetite. <laughs> But I think this sense of overt responsibility of working harder than anyone else to be the same as everybody else to not letting yourself off the hook means that there is no chink for criticism. Ah, good one. Yeah. Um, oh, that makes sense. No chink for criticism. And yet there is this kind of wishful thinking about wanting to play more, have more fun. Um, and then and you, does criticism, uh, does that link up with rejection? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And that makes sense. Okay. I think that you've never been taught f functional, constructive criticism. I think where you've seen criticism, and maybe your father said something awful to your mother that you heard, I mean, I, you've either seen it or it's been levied at you, but it feels to me like maybe you've ne never really understood why that was coming your way. So you have to defend against it completely mm. by being perfect. I would dearly like you to find a photo of you young. Mm -hmm. About six, seven year old. Mm -hmm. I want you to choose it and it shouldn't have anyone else in it. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to have affection for him. What, positive affection? Yeah, I need you oh. to feel affectionate towards him. No, because there's a photograph that is the photograph that I think is the saddest photograph of me ever, which is when I was in my school uniform, being sent off to that boarding school for the first time. How do you feel about it? Oh, it makes me, makes me want to cry. Okay, you feel I know, sorry. Because I look at that boy and I just think inside he was dying. It was like the beginning of the end. Right, he needs to know you're with him. So when you look at all these things, your mother, your father, the, the, your sister, whatever it may be, don't look at it without him at your side, knowing that you and he are a team. Because that will make the difference. Thank you for coming in. It's truly been wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.
broke me down. I mean... Can she rebuild me? Uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've got goosebumps for that. And that is why this is going to be the best session of the festival, because nobody, nobody is going to be that honest about anything. Um, I mean, Ben, what, what was it like watching that back? Because... Actually, that was, that was, I found that quite upsetting, actually. Uh, I did find that quite moving towards the end. Um, I think she's incredibly clever. And I think it was a very useful experience. Um, uh, and I went into it absolutely open-hearted. I really wanted to do it. I'm aware of my, my disabilities uh, uh, and my handicaps uh, and, and the, the, the barriers that I put up. And I, I like to think that that... You know, I am very driven and I am very passionate and I am very controlling... And I am very um, determined and I work really hard and I take my responsibilities, you know, for the channel really seriously. You know, my responsibility is to grow that audience and to bring in those demographics and find hit shows. I take it really seriously and I famously... You take it personally. I take well. it very personally and I famously, you know, don't really take holidays because, you know, I'm always working. And I really care about my team. I mean, I really care too much about my team sometimes. I think sometimes I'm a little lenient on them. Hello. <laughs> You know, a bit, bit too nice sometimes. You know, I need, you know, they've just read the Alex Ferguson book on leadership, and I think discipline is going to be our new word going forward. Uh oh. But, but, you know, I, I, but I also care about, you know, uh, this I think is maybe one of the main reasons for, you know, the small independent companies. These are people who are brave enough to put themselves out there and go, I want to go it alone. They are going to take a wall of rejection. Now, I don't take, I never put myself anywhere where I can be rejected. So, I have a real empathy, I think, for those companies that come in that are brave enough to come and see me to pitch their wares that may be not right, um, that may be completely wrong. And I, I always try, I may not always succeed, but I always try, even in the most difficult of meetings where they just don't get me, they just don't get the channel, they just don't get the ideas, to help them go away feeling better about themselves. Comes back to being the underdog. I, well, I, I think you've got to help each mm. other. And, and I, I, I suppose I have a bit of a, an eye or an ear for people who are struggling maybe more than others. And maybe that's why I'm intimidated by very confident, successful, rich companies. Mm. Because they have more power and money and everything than me. And I am the underdog to them. So I, I would tend to look down so I can nurture. I thought that was, I thought that, that was, that was quite interesting. Uh, well... Huge round of applause there. Lots of people getting in touch on the app as well. Uh, somebody saying, really enjoying the therapy session with Ben. Really interesting. Thank you for the insight. And you talked a lot about rejection in your therapy session. How much does your fear of that affect your role as director of programmes, do you think? Uh, actually, funnily enough, I don't think it affects me in, my, in the job I do. Mm. I, I'm actually really good at, uh, I think I'm good at managing upwards. I'm very clear about what I believe we should be doing to make the channel successful. Mm. Um, how we should work, what we should do, why we shouldn't work. Um, it's beyond my own comfort limit. It's beyond the people that I know and trust. So I can manage up and I can manage down, and, I, and I'm very protective and uh, defensive of the Channel 5 team. Um, but beyond that, I mean, as I said, I don't sit on any juries, I don't go towards award ceremonies, I don't never go to parties. I went to a dinner last night. Uh, I thought it was going to be a very small dinner, and then I found out it was quite a big dinner. And I, when I, I found it was a slight, nightmare. Well, I, no, 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 it wasn't. But when I found it was a slightly bigger dinner, I went, mm. OK, how do I get out of this? That was my immediate reaction was, how do I cancel this without offending them? And actually, it was, they were, the great and the good were there. I mean, it was the great and the good of television. It was like, whoa. And I suddenly met all these people that I've heard about for the last five years. Like, oh, you were on BBC too. I didn't know. You know oh, you were on Factual on BBC. I, didn't, I never met you before. So it was quite interesting. But it was, it, it was quite a controlled environment. And the host very kindly sat next to me to protect me because mm. she knew that I would be... Uh, very vulnerable, very nervous, and very shy. So maybe if you're inviting Ben out for lunch, maybe a one-on-one -on -one is better rather than a big group thing. Um, but in terms of rejection and how that shapes you, is that why you didn't put yourself forward for the Channel 4 job? Uh, I would say that was certainly part of the, part of the multitude of equations. Yes, I think it's, it's absolutely. But at the same time, you know, and I, and I, you know, I gave it some thought. At the same time, I'm, I don't want to put myself out and be rejected, but I'm loving Channel 5. I'm really proud of what we've done, and I still think we've got a good way to go before my time at Channel 5 will be over. Uh, we've got some really good stuff coming through, and I kind, of, I kind of want to finish the job. When I left Channel 4 the first time, I knew I'd done the job. Mm. I was ready to go. 
When I left Channel 5 last time, I was fired, so maybe I you know. uh, I've come back. I want to finish what I started. Channel 5 is very much you, and you shape the direction of the channel and its content. How much do you struggle with the fact that you're operating, say, on a third of Channel 4's budget? I've always had and a small want, budget. I've always had small budget. But you want to compete with we the do compete, of Channel 4. But we do compete. You know, quite often this year, we've beaten them one, two, three days across a week. Um, we do compete very successfully. You know, we have to manage our money. We can't pay as much, so we, I, I like to think we can compensate in other ways. We can be quick making decisions. We can be a pleasure to work with. We are famous for not interfering. You know, I commissioned Rich House, Poor House, literally on two lines of format. I went to Guy and I said, it's called Rich House, Poor House. This is what happens. We'll do four. I never even saw the programme. Guy looked after the programme. I was sitting having breakfast and the ratings came through, 1.8 million. It's like, oh my God, that's a hit show. I better watch it. Um, <laughs> you know. So you I, can be I quite hands off. No, because my job, my <laughs> job is to steer the ship. Yeah. My job is to decide where we're going to be in nine months' time. What is the tone? What is the mix of light and shade? Where, you know, should we rogue into Saturday nights? What would be the pieces that we'd need? How would I spend the money? Should we recommission that? What, what are we missing? How do we enhance our reputation? The commissioner's job is to pull together all the ideas and to pitch the ideas to me. And we will discuss, I think it's a good idea, they think it's a really bad idea, I go, I really want to do it, they go, I'm not sure we should do it, whatever, whatever, whatever. Mm. The producer's job is to make the programme. Mm. It is not the commissioner's job to sit in an edit suite and find cut a programme and to change the music and to fiddle with the title sequence. And to, you know, they go in as a new pair of eyes, and they go, okay, I like it, I understand it, okay, now I'm confused, let's do a bit of work on this bit. Okay, I think the storytelling's a bit, or I'm a bit bored now, what can we do? But their job is to just be the new pair of eyes and to represent the viewer. Are they enjoying it? Do they get it? Do they want to come back next week? The producer's job, the production team's job, is to make the programme. It's not the commissioner's job, and it's certainly not my job, to sit and watch every single programme and go, take a tweak out there, change the font of that, you know, graphics there, blah, blah. It's, it's insanity. So, um, I let people... <laughs> but, you know, I, I really simply, part of our, the reasons for our success, our numerous. We're a very small team and we're very collaborative. We all work together, we're all in it, we all work hard and we all care. We let people do their jobs. That frees us up to do our jobs. And we have a really strong, driven, I think, by my gut instinct, feeling for what viewers want. We understand our viewers, we like our viewers, we are happy to have more viewers, we don't want to ever lose a viewer. Um, and we work very hard to reward viewers with our content. Whatever that content is, when we sit in meetings, you know, Lucy and I have recently been discussing this big Rome series that we're doing with Bethany Hughes. That is not a Channel 5 show traditionally. It is not commissioned to be traditional Channel 5. It is to bring upmarket viewers to the channel and go, golly, who'd have thought Channel 5, Bethany Hughes, Rome? We discussed what sort of stories we should, you know, how heavy do we make it and how light do we make it? How accessible, how non-accessible? And we decided at the end, this is a statement piece about Channel 5. This is not like Rome for lots and lots and lots of people, mm. for, for Joe Blogs. This is for slightly intellectual people. So if Bethany Hughes says we're going to talk about Constantinople and have Latin in it, we're going to have it. Because she's the expert on Rome. I'm not the expert on Rome. Lucy's not the expert on Rome. But Bethany Hughes is. And you want to make an authoritative piece of television. We know it's not for the massive Channel 5 viewers. It is for a slightly smaller, upmarket, clever audience who want to be intellectually challenged, visually excited. And hopefully that will bring new viewers, the, the enticement of watching Rome will bring those new viewers to the channel. It's programmes like Alex Polizzi in Spain that have brought new viewers to the channel. Well, it's funny you should mention Rome because I just haven't, happen to have a clip. Interested to see it now. Let's have a look. For Rome, the spoils of conquest weren't just territories and treasures, but slaves. Huh? The massive majority of these women and men were treated with absolute brutality. So you just have to try to imagine the nagging fear that their Roman masters must have felt that one day this mass of humanity might rise up against them. What is your name, slave? 
What is your name? My name is Spartacus. She is voluptuous and delicious. I think she is. I think she's <laughs> magnificent. She's like the bow of a ship. Mm. I. I <laughs> I'm kind Very of nautical theme. She wears, she wears a horrible pair of boots throughout the whole series, which is the only thing, the only thing I don't like. That's why you only saw are, it from there. They are the worst boots in the world. I would never have signed them. I think, I just think she's, she's, I think she's more exciting than the drama, actually. You know, I just cannot take my eyes off her. I think she is just fabulous. So that's Channel 5 branching out to something new, trying to attract a, a more upmarket audience. Well, it's sort of a continuation of the path that we've been on, which mm. is attracting upmarket, more history, dramatised history, yeah. that kind of stuff, yeah. Um, and you've had a good year, as we touched on earlier on, yeah. but what have been the challenges in the last year? What perhaps hasn't worked as well as you'd like to, and, uh, and what have you done to rectify that? Golly, what well, hasn't worked? Um, oh, gosh, I never know. I, well, I'm sure quite a few things haven't worked as we thought. Uh, you What's know, been particularly challenging? What's kept you awake at night? Nothing's kept me awake at night. I mean, we've had, no, I don't, think, I don't think we've ever, have we had any really big flops this year? Have we? Front row's going. <laughs> I don't, think we've had any, I don't think we've had any big flops. I mean, challenges are things like, where do we play blind date? Big agony is over. Should it play on a Friday? Should it play on a Saturday? You know, I feel we sort of understand Monday to Friday. You'll see that we've given you all... Um, a, a, it's a sort of schedule. This is like a tool for you to understand us better. And what we've done is we've, you know, put our 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock okay. shows in there. Well, that and was going to be our big finale, the oh, okay, big takeaway gift. Oh, okay. As usual, he doesn't play by the rules. So okay. just in case you're wondering what he's talking about. I wanted to give you all a car like seat. Oprah Winfrey, but they said that, you know. <laughs> so Budget's we'll get, quite small but, this year. So, but this is, 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 a, is a device that will help you, you know, play the game, which is you can see that each night has a different tone. And you can say, you know, if, if I'm thinking of ideas for Channel 5, what might be a good idea to play after Police Intercept? So this is Monday? the dream schedule. Well, this is what your dream schedule looks like. This is, these are all our hit shows and the, the, the days that they play on. And your job is to help us find shows that can play alongside these shows, that can take some of the weight off these shows. So GPs, Behind Closed Doors, we commission 50 episodes a year. It's great for Jonathan. It's a worry to me in case people stop watching that show. At the moment, they all still love it, which is great. But, you know, it would be irresponsible not to try new things. So we tried three episodes of Highland Midwife, which was a similar sort of tone, real people, warm-hearted, uh, that, that played in that slot for three weeks and did, did very nicely for us. And we know that we've got a few alternatives up our sleeve, which is very helpful. So, you know, you look at Can't Pay, We'll Take It Away on whatever night, like Wednesday night, and you go, what would I like to watch as a viewer after Can't Pay, We'll Take It Away? What's the kind of programme that I would like to watch? Let's brainstorm what we might pitch for after Can't Pay, We'll Take It Away. So that's what that, that sort of is. And on the back are, are the commissioning team. That is it. There are no other people. There are no departments. There are no deputies or anything. This is all we are. Can I just say that if you got something from Channel 5 that had all the commissioners on there, it would be a fold-out edition. You mean Channel 4? What did I... Oh, so yeah, sorry, beg your pardon. Channel 4, just going yeah. across. We'd have to stand at either end of the stage yeah. to it's, hold up all the commissioners. People, and a lot more money. We have 10 people and we have £200 million. Does that make it easier Well, you know, you have to make, to quick, commission you have to make quick decisions. And we're always in contact with mm. each other. You know, we can talk about everything. We can, I mean, I go out and sit with the whole team virtually every day and, you know, I sit with the press team and we'll sit with the scheduling team and we'll sit with the digital channels and go, you know, what's up, what should we do? What do we think about this? What, what do you think about that programme on BBC? And what do you think ITV are going to do? And should we worry about that? And how's this looking? And is this a worry to us? And do we need to spend some more money on that? And do we need to reshoot and whatever it is? And then we do weekly routines where we can go through all the challenges or not challenges and we can gossip and we can talk about, you know, other channels and who might be working on other channels or not working on other channels and we can talk about, you know, the, the, you know, the competitive schedule and things. So I, I think in a way it makes it much easier because we're incredibly hands on. You know, like I said yesterday, I've charged all the commissioning team with finding a new regional company mm -hmm. to work with this year because we want to meet new people. I really want to support the regions um, and I don't think they get enough love. Uh, you know, with the different members of the team, we've been doing a little tour of the country. We're going down to Bristol in a couple of weeks time to do a meet and greet down in Bristol and a sort of, you know, how can we help you get inside our heads? Um, and they've also been charged to look at every programme and how can we make them representative to the best of our abilities where we are? And it's much easier to do it with 10 people mm. than endless departments. Mm. One of the first things I did when I came was get rid of the middle layer so that I could have direct contact, direct contact with the commissioners. I'm very hands-on and, 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 I, and I like having conversations, creative conversations about 
What are we missing? What could we do? Who do we like? Who's up and coming? Where are the new companies? What are we missing? What are other people doing that we need mm. to keep an eye on, etc., etc.? Mm. The dream, I suppose, is finding that production company in Middlesbrough when you were talking about your viewers. There must be one, there must be one. Right, um, let's talk about. Um, what should we talk Sorry, about? I've blown so, your scheduling gag. Now. You have. We've gone all over the place, but it's okay, I can roll with it. It's like, it's like rolling news, it's yeah, fine. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about drama and where that fits into Channel 5. I it mean, doesn't really at the moment. And is that the plan? Well, we will have a drama next year. We will have, Sebastian's working on a drama. We will have a drama next year. Our first scripted drama in God knows how long. Uh, you know, I, we all want to have drama, but also, as I said yesterday, the truth is BBC and ITV have a lot of drama. There's a lot of drama on Netflix and Amazon. You know, I can't compete with the big boys. I think we should have it, and I think it can be useful to us when other people are not doing drama, which is quite rare. Mm. But it's expensive for us. And, you know, I, I like to play, for us, play to our strengths. I, I, I do think that we are the best factual pro channel in British broadcasting. If you look at the range of programmes that we do, everything from the Yorkshire Vet, you know, the GPs behind closed doors, Can't Pay Will Take It Away, In Therapy, The Accused, Slum Britain 50 Years On, Black Britain 50 years, you know, if you look at our range and our history stuff and our, and our, so and our natural on history strengths. stuff, you just look at what we do and you go, mm. we are really good at it. We are getting mm. really good at it. We are good at it. We're getting really good at it. And I think we should pay to our strengths. Mm. You know, the budget is the budget. The advertising market is not great at the moment. So we should have drama. We will have drama. But drama is not the answer to our prayers. Mm. The answer to us being successful is to be creative with what we do best, which is factual and factual entertainment. Um, let's talk about Saturday night, because if you look at that dream schedule you, you've got in front of you, Saturday and Sunday are missing. And yeah. Saturday, yeah. super competitive. And obviously, Blind Date, a lot of was made out of that when, yeah. you, when you decided to reinvigorate the format. Do you think you will focus on competing on Saturday night? I think are you there inviting are, commissions I think, for that? I think, I think there are places, uh, places on a Saturday where we can compete. We proved with Blind Date, and it was a strategic move to take Blind Date, and you know, there's lots of very funny stories about Blind Date that one day when we have more time we will share with you. They will <laughs> make a very fat chapter in Sean Doyle's book. Poor Sean is the commissioner who's managed Blind Date and all the <laughs> talent involved. Uh, there's a lot of talent involved in Blind Date. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, and it was a strategic decision to risk putting it on a Saturday where we basically played football and repeats, and the football nobody was really watching. Um, we knew we could do Monday to Friday. We knew we could have big success Monday to Friday. What were we going to do about Saturday and Sunday? Just leave them? We can't do seven days a week. We don't have the money. But I did think if we could get a million at Saturday with Blind Date, with a couple of quick commissions around it, we, we would have something to build on. And I think we proved that actually we can, at certain times of the year, when it's not X Factor and it's not Strictly and in the summer, whatever, we can have some very big Saturday nights. Aren't the, I think the... Two out of the six blind date weeks were the highest rating days of the week. If it's Saturday, the highest rating day of the week on Channel 5. Mm. That's insane. But it shows where we can go. Mm. Um, and I think it's part of the involvement of the channel. Again, we've got to be aware that other bigger channels have a lot more money and they have juggernaut shows. But that doesn't mean to say that when they take the foot off the gas or when they're playing Kids Voice on ITV, which, no, which we know can only do three million, there isn't a space for us to get a couple of million. Do and a couple of million for us is, is a, big. Is, is big. Yeah. Um, and talking about entertainment, Big Brother, um, you have created a Twitter storm over the last 24 hours <laughs> at the I'm, airport I'm, on the way up. I'm it was exploding on, on my phone. Now, if you could be trolled on email, I'm getting hate mail from Big Brother. Fans. You know you've made it then. Yeah. Um, but in terms of Big Brother, you said in the leaders' debate that. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, you basically said that. It, it wasn't your show. If it's you not, probably had the choice again, you wouldn't have it on Channel 5, but you have to work with what you've been given. But you don't feel that you have been able to put your stamp on that show. Is that the issue? No, no. I why think, it's not I look, working? I, I look, Big Brother has been hugely successful for Channel 5. It has been a very valuable show to Channel 5 in terms of bringing young viewers to the audience. But I made it very clear when I came, it would be irresponsible to have one show carrying that amount of weight and responsibility. That gives the production company a gun held to my head, and I don't need that. So we've worked over four years to find other shows that can attract young viewers. Some of them are very strategic, like Make or Break, whose youngs were bigger than, than Civilian Big Brother. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's, its audience was smaller, but its youngs were really fantastic, 70%, 1634s. Rich House, Poor House, Blind Date, GPs Behind Closed Doors. These are young, skewing shows, um, and they're very valuable to us. So we're spreading the load. We're at a point where we're going to come up to contract renewal, Will you renew it? We're going to have a discussion about it. I need to know, as I would with any commission, 
What are the plans for the future? How will it be creatively renewed? How is it still important to me? How can we make it a valuable proposition to me? Like all our shows, they have to have a value. I pay a certain amount of money and I kind of need a return on that investment in terms of ratings. And if I they think, can make it and, more and Ben and look, Frow, and I, no, would you commission no, no, it in terms about of ben what Frow. you want? It's, about, it's a very established brand. It's been a very successful brand. There's a big new shiny show on the block called Love Island. And we need to take a good long look at Big Brother and go, what does it look like for the future? Mm. What is Big Brother of the future? And that means creative people, creative people getting together in a room and thrashing it out. Mm. And it might get bloody and it might be tough. But for the sake of the show, you have to sometimes have those conversations. Um, and now is the time that we're going to have those conversations. Is that shy? But it was, you know, I can't shy away from it. I mean, mm. my press man's sitting there looking at me going, shut the fuck up here. <laughs> shut the fuck up. <laughs> Please do not say more. But we do it about a lot of shows. Security, take him out. We don't but need we, him in here. But we do it about a lot of shows. When the shows are coming back for three, four, five, six, seven series. Kevin Lieber talked about it on ITV. X Factor, Renewal. Hey, now how do they refresh it? Britain's Got Talent. How do you refresh it? How do we refresh? How do we make these shows relevant for now? How do we make them as lively and as bright and as shiny and as, as, as um, exciting for viewers as they have been in the past. And everything, everything that we do needs to have that rigour attached to it. And I don't think Big Brother, just because it's a big brand, mm. should be any exception to the rule. You talk about fresh, shiny new shows attracting and keeping that younger audience on Channel 5. Is Bad Habits going to be one of those? Because basically you're taking in Geordie Shaw type no, I think characters bad, bad, bad into a nunnery. Re- bad Habits is a really great example of the commissioning team working in collaboration with the independent company. Mm. You know, it came from a brainstorm um, where they were all talking together. I think there were about two or three commissioners with Crackett discussing various ideas. It came from a brainstorm. There was a lot of discussion about could it, should it, would it, would we, could we, do we like it, don't we like it. It was pitched to me as a title. We all quite liked the title. I was very nervous about it, you know, because I could see it could be brilliant, but it also could be like a bit shit, frankly. Um, <laughs> Uh, and a bit slight and a bit kind of like, oh, it's so silly. But I think the very good thing that we did as a, as a, as a department was to put crack it and to make this show through Guy and documentaries. Mm. And it is the most fantastic show because it's not what you think it's going to be. It's so much more. It is life affirming, positive, funny, moving. It has real depth. And I think that it could have been made in a number of ways. Like a lot of ideas, it could have gone down the reality route and it could have gone down the features route. And I think that putting that type of show and doing it through a documentary prism has actually made it a great show. OK, well, let's have a little look. Here's uh, Bad Habits. The Convent of the Sacred Heart. Home to a devout sisterhood of Catholic nuns. We pray for four to five hours a day. They're dedicated to the salvation of others. I want to be a saint. That's my goal. With one eye on the modern world. Personally, I've never taken a selfie. (laughs) They're now opening their doors for the first time ever. Oh, my goodness. Wow. To five very modern young women. To transform the world, a necklace is really not a good idea. Hard partying, selfie obsessed, they represent a generation in danger of losing their way. But are they happy? Tyler, what are you doing? Like, what are you actually doing? I feel like my self worth comes from Instagram. I was like daddy's little girl. <laughs> they had love it to be how it used to be. But they're looking for happiness, aren't they? Over the next month, they'll confront their lifestyles. Oh my God. In the one place they never thought they'd find themselves, a convent. Are you actually gonna turn me into a nun? I'm in a convent. This is hell. I felt a little bit like I was in my own in-therapy session there as someone who went to a convent school. That brought back all sorts of memories. But anyway, um, let's talk about Elephant House, uh, the studios, and you are expanding Elephant House studios. And a lot of independent companies are going to look at that and go, how can we compete? How can oh, we can work compete. with Channel they 5? Yeah, they can compete. Really? Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's a, it's a There's small... There's room for everyone. Oh, without question. I mean, it's, it would be like ITV but in really early days. I mean, it is, it, it is an in-house studio, but they certainly do not take priority. Um, I think they would say that themselves. 
I mean, if anything, the relationship between myself and, and Elephant House is much more fraught than with any other independent. I mean, it makes <laughs> Big Brother look like a party. Um, um, you know, and I'm, it's a new show. <laughs> I am really, I'm really tough on them. I'm really tough on them. You know, you have to earn a commission. It's not like, you know, we're giving away freebies here. There's a lot of people out there with a lot of good ideas. Our job is to find the best ideas and work with the best people. You know, no one gets a favour in this world. We don't have the money to give people favours and to, you know, to give people you know, free commissions just for the sake of it. So they have to work harder than anybody else, if anything. It's right. like having a, a relation working with you. You know, they have to go above and beyond in order to get commissions. I feel a bit sorry for them sometimes because okay. I am really tough on them. So you're tougher on Elephant House than you are on Independence. Yeah. Hmm, let's put that to the test, shall we? Uh, we're going to invite a panel up here now of uh, independent companies, heads of, uh, who work with Channel 5, just to get an insight uh, into what it's like to work with a channel, its commissioners, and of course with Ben. And again, I don't know what they're going to say. <laughs> uh, let's uh, let's bring them up. They've pledged to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So please welcome uh, Paul Stead from Daisy Beck. We have Mel Leach from Two Four, and Malcolm Brinkworth from Brinkworth Films. Welcome to the stage. Now. This, this is where you take your company into your own hands, talking to Ben about what it's yeah, like really to work with Channel 5. <laughs> yeah. I really don't want to fuck this up. Um, Mel, I'll start with you. It's start by explaining some of the programmes that you've made for Channel 5. So, I mean, we make some of our most valuable programmes at 2.4 for Channel 5, not least The Hotel Inspector, which is the longest running show in our catalogue, and I think maybe the longest running show on Channel 5, I'm mm, not sure. Probably. Um, ben commissioned it the first time around. So it started its life when Ben was there at the beginning with a different presenter. Uh, My shows never die. <laughs> <laughs> that location, location on Channel 4. <laughs> Can't kill it. And Ruth got stolen and uh, we put um, Alex Plitzy on it. Mm -hmm. And it kind of got a new lease of life. But actually when Ben came back uh, to the channel the second time, it was ticking along, it was doing okay, but it had slightly kind of lost its luster, I would say. Um, Ben was really honest about it. He was like, I don't want to be the controller who cancels this show, particularly since I started it. But if you want it to survive, you're going to have to tear it up and reinvent it. Mm. Very similar kind of conversation to what we've been hearing about Big Brother. And that was a challenge because it's, you know, you've got a production team who've done it in a certain way for a certain amount of time. And you were really honest with us. You said, you've got one more roll of the dice, change it, make it better, be brave, do, you know, completely reinvent it. And actually, we rose to that challenge, I think, and the show has come back stronger as a result of it. And hopefully we'll continue for, you know, hopefully it's got Forever. more life in it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to live us all. <laughs> it's a dream commission. And Paul, just explain, uh, you know, the programmes that you have produced for Channel 5 and how you found it working with them as a channel in terms of getting something commissioned and the working process. Are they easy to work with? No. <laughs> um, but it shouldn't be easy. I mean, it... are we not easy to work with? Yes, you are easy to oh, okay. work with. Mm -hmm. but there's a story behind it. The, the first, the first meeting I had with Ben, I was, I was terrified. I'd never met Ben before, um, and I'd heard, you know, he's, he's quite difficult, and he knows what he wants, and, and, and so I was very nervous, understandably. And it wasn't helped by the fact that Richard Desmond walked in halfway through our first meeting, and he said to to Ben. What are you doing meeting? I was with a friend. He said, What are you doing meeting these two guys? And Ben said, Well, you never know who's going to walk through the door with the next big idea. And, and he said, Why wouldn't I want to see them? So he looked at me, this is Richard Desmond, and says, Because he's wearing cheap shoes. Lit up a cigarette and walked out. <laughs> so ben, ben said, never, never mind all that. He says, You go and think about some ideas. And I went back three weeks later and came out with Body Donors, which was our first commission. Um, and Daisy Beck at that point was. Um, we were running out of work. We'd been running for 15 years and the, the commissions were just drying up. It, was, it, it wasn't a good time for us. And Body Donors was kind of a, a two year long commitment. It was a really big uh, challenge. Um, and we started production with Simon Rakes who saw some of the characters we were bringing through. And Ben had a, a meeting, I think, with, with Simon and said, um, we want to do, let's, let's find a vet in Yorkshire. By the way, Middlesbrough is in Yorkshire, of oh, course. Oh, wow. Yes, it has to be. Um, and uh, he said, um, who do we know that could find us a, the, the real James Herriot, the real old creatures, great and small? And Simon had been working with us looking at some characters. Well, they're in Yorkshire. They seem to get good characters. Uh, we'll, ring, we'll ring Daisy Beck. And he rang me up. We were actually in a Channel 4 meeting at the time. And he says, Ben Frau wants you to go and find the real James Herriot. Go and do it. And so we did. Um, we've, we found um, the original practice where James Herriot worked. And that was the genesis of, of, of the Yorkshire vet. 
Um, but it wasn't a done deal because we got this practice and there were several vets in it and you were very adamant about that it had to be one vet. And actually, neither vet really wanted to be the, the star attraction of it. But um, Now they both want to be the star attraction. Now they both <laughs> want it. It's a nightmare. Oh. Even they've become talent. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. They've become talent. So we, we started out with six episodes. Um, and quite honestly, it's been, it's been life-changing uh, for us because that first meeting, when, when I had the cheap shoes, these are a bit more expensive now. Um, <laughs> thanks to Ben. Um, we, we, we were th probably three months away from bankruptcy. Mm. Um, sitting here today, we're probably about two years away from, from bankruptcy. I think this is a really important thing because for me, it's a two-way street. Mm. You know, the, the greatest thing I've ever got given was a card from Paul at Christmas talking about how his company had changed, the employment in the area had changed, and the thirst where the uh, vet practice is was now a tourist destination, so a load of businesses had changed. And I kind of go, I mean, it makes me go cold now, because I go, that's the impact that we can have on society. You know, going back to Jon Snow and Grenfell and all that kind of thing, we can make a difference to people's lives, not just for people in the production, in television production, but in those areas, those sort of slightly more deprived areas or lower class areas. I may be using the wrong phrases, excuse me. Um, but in return, I get a show that is a foundation piece of the schedule that is really loved, that we can commission, you know, two years in advance. Um, and it is that fantastic... Um, relationship between an independent who is getting money and success and hopefully awards and employing people and making a difference and we are getting a product that makes our channel more successful. That's when it is really fantastic. It's, a, it's, it's the best part of the job, frankly. Um, Malcolm, remind us of some of the programmes you've made for Channel 5 and what you find different about working with Channel 5 compared to other channels. I think it's just worth going back a little bit to pick up a bit on what Paul was saying and because when you, I think if you think back four or five years and what the, the channel was like then, it's a very different place. And one of the first things in the commissioning meetings I had was it was the word ambition was used. And actually ambition was never a word you would normally associate with Channel 5 at that point. And it was raise the bar. Let's be ambitious. Let's take risks. Let's do that. And so the idea that Channel 5 was going to take on challenging program programming was, was something very different. And so Can't Pay, Take It Away actually came out of that process, mm. which is how can we actually see the law being enforced you know, in, a, in a time when austerity is a real issue, when debt is a real issue, when evictions are at all time high, when people are becoming more and more indebted. How do we, re how do we show that? How do, and how do we make that popular? You know, Can't Pay now takes, it's in its fifth season, but you know, it now averages around just over two million every single show it goes out. Um, but at the same time when we started, that was never the case. And actually to take on a ch with a channel and say, actually, let's build that show, let's take it from a four-parter, let's build it, let's build it, let's build it to what it is now, was something very unusual. At the same time, if you think back, as w I mean, again, we've made The Accused. Now, The Accused tells the story of, effectively, what it's like when you're charged with a serious yeah. crime. And... You know, that's a really bespoke piece, it's a really landmark piece, it's an ambitious piece, and that requires uh, an investment from the channel to take, again, a creative risk. You know, it's a, it's a great show, uh, we're doing more, but actually it's also been recognised in the industry as being a landmark show. Now, both stories actually are synonymous with the change that's actually happened within the channel in that period. And I think that a lot of indies now who were really quite sniffy about oh, Channel 5, or do, do we, we're, you're mm. at the bottom of the list. Actually, they're not, you know, I think for a lot of us now, they're actually at the top of the list in terms of where we want to take our challenging programming and where we want to take those creative risks to make a difference, as Ben says, about the way in which we look at our content. And that's, that's, that's a change. Are there any negatives? I'll throw it to three of you so you can all take the hit together. <laughs> Are there any negatives of working at Channel 5? Is there something they could work on as a channel? Ben's open to... To ideas in terms of how they can better forge a relationship between well, themselves and India. We've talked about this before. I think um, there's been a certain amount of um, pressure on. The, they've got a small team, and so sometimes the business affairs can potentially be slower than in other channels. Um, largely, I suspect, down to resourcing, um, and that can be an issue when you're up against production pressures mm. and you're, you know, you need contracts in order to be able to get out and shoot. So, I think that's an area that could be improved upon. Budgets are tight. Budgets are tighter. Money's tight. But then what you mm. said earlier is also true. You know, the budgets are tighter, but the management of the channel is, uh, is easier on the producers. And so actually working with you and your team 
is a much less onerous proposition than in other channels. And we, and we do like working together. I mean, uh, we, we took uh, one night with my ex, uh, which was, uh, we, were, we were showing a tape. It was made as a, a pilot for Channel 4. I think we can say that. Channel 4 decided they didn't want it. We looked at it. We really liked it. Uh, we commissioned the series. Uh, the series didn't perform as well as we'd liked, but it was very young. We all loved the fact that it brought a very different tone to the channel. It looked different amongst all the other programmes as well, because you're always wanting to evolve. And then we did a great piece of research, and we all sat together, got the research back, and listened to the viewers and what they liked about it and what they didn't like about it and what they wanted more of and what they wanted less of, and worked together on how to change the, the, the sort of positioning of that programme as we recommissioned. We knew we were going to recommission, but we just wanted to make sure that we would kind of try and get a slightly bigger audience and give the viewers more of what they liked. And it was a really collaborative process, wasn't it? Really it, was, it was all, everyone together, discussing strengths, weaknesses and opportunities. Also quite unusual because, I mean, in honesty, the numbers, as you say, it skewed young and that was great, but the numbers weren't the numbers that we were all hoping for. And I think, you know, it was a show that for us, we were really passionate about it. When we brought it into Ben, we were like, we just really want to make this, we believe in it. And luckily you believed in it too. We made it with Guy, it was incredibly difficult to cast. You know, we were still casting people, I think, three days out from the rig shoot, and everyone was calm at the channel. There wasn't, you know, no one was having a heart attack. Well, I was having a bit of a heart attack. <laughs> but, you know, it was a process that we went through completely hand in hand, then sat on some numbers where we were a bit like, oh, God, they're not quite good enough. Mm. But actually, you loved it, and, you know, your team liked it, and it got backed again. And that is, for a production company, quite unusual. You know, often that doesn't happen. To get help. A, channel. to get help and B, to get support to go, OK, what can we learn and what can we do differently? We'll give it another go and hopefully the next season will bring greater numbers. And, you know, if it doesn't, then that'll be the end of the show. Or not. But, well, maybe, but, maybe. but you kind of hope, at least you're getting a chance to try and learn from what you've done in season one and bring a bigger audience to season two. And actually, if you look at some of the hits that, you know, we all now recognise, Gogglebox started small, First Date mm. started small. Those shows had to evolve. GP started small. Mm. You know, and now we've commissioned you know, 50 episodes a year. So you invest in something and you have faith in well, it. Well, I, th I think, good idea. I think there are some shows who just kind of go, I really love this show and I, I don't want to get it, get, mm. let it go. I really believe in it, whether it rates or doesn't rate. There are other shows where you go, I still think there's something in this show. We were right initially, but we haven't got it right. I think we need to invest more. We need to try it again. And then there are shows where you go, you know what, we tried it. It just didn't quite hit the numbers. I think we just draw a line underneath it and move on. Um, and, and every show is different and every show brings a different thing to the channel. We want every show to be a success. Mm. But at the same time, if every show is a success, we won't be commissioning any more shows because they'd all be returning. So the natural order of life is that some shows have to die in order for new shows to come through. OK, uh, we've just got three minutes left before the session comes to an end. Uh, some of you have been sending in some questions. I've got one at the top here. Um, ben, if you help an indie come up with an idea, do you take more of the back-end rights? It sort of depends on the indie. It sort of depends on how much we've come up with. Um, if it's an idea that I have come up with, that I come up with the title and we come up with the... The format and we come up with everything we might take we we'll take a bit more i think it's only fair if it's you know you haven't had to do any research you haven't had to do any development you haven't had to make any phone calls um but i do and i've always said this i do think it has to be fair we have to be fair with the independent companies no point in us going in with a land grab because we came up with a title or called up and said the you know yorkshire vet or whatever it is you know because if we don't have respect with from the indies they won't come and work with us so i think there's always a discussion to be had about who, you know, what is our contribution, if there is any contribution, and how much is that contribution worth? OK, uh, this has come in as well. Do you think in supporting the underdogs that Channel 5 could be a platform for new directors? Um, I, I, I think we should always be trying new things, certainly with some of our documentary stuff, you know, if we're not going to do... And with our drama as well, I'm trying to encourage Sebastian, you know, if we can't do big, multi, multi, multi-million pound drama, let's at least use it as an opportunity to, to nurture new talent and give new talent a chance to try something different, because at least then we feel we're doing something really creative. Um, and Lucy's very, very keen to get more female directors into Specialist Factual, you know, so our commissioners all have sort of little missions and projects that they, that, that they want to work on um, as Can part I of the overall you a picture. Question. You've often said in the past that you felt that um, lots of the companies have looked down on Channel 5, haven't come in with their best ideas. Do you think that's changed now? Uh, I still think there are quite a few companies who look down their nose at Channel 5. Uh, but you know what, I don't think I really want to work with them, frankly. I think, <laughs> uh, I think there has been a shift in perception. And I think smart companies know that they can be successful uh, through Channel 5 and with Channel 5, and a lot of the prejudice has gone. There is still some there. There will always be some there. It's sort of inherent. 
But no, I think there has been a change. Yeah. OK. Uh, well, we have run out of time. That has been the quickest hour of the festival, I'm sure. But before you go, a little treat for you. Um, you may remember in Ben's therapy session, he mentioned the photo, the photo that he visualised of his, him as a little boy. And we've gone through the family archives. And here it is. Oh. <laughs> That is, a, that is a boy smiling to please his mother, and inside he is dying. That is the day it all ended. That's the day happiness ended for you. So. Can I, can I but the smart, anything? snappy dressing never left you. School uniform. Can I just say something? Because I'd, I'd like you to talk to that little boy and just uh -huh. tell him. <laughs> Therapy live. So, tell him that in the last year alone, you've created 63 jobs in Yorkshire. There's a whole thing about you know, diversity and out, outside, of, outside of London. All the other channels claim what they're doing and Channel 5 never gets the, the credit for it. I think you should talk to that little boy. 63 jobs in Yorkshire across the year, 25% up um, in tourism in Thirsk. You've transformed our company, you've transformed lots of others. He should be very pleased and he should reconnect. Paul, what a wonderful note to end on. Paul, Malcolm, Nell, thank you. And of course, Ben Frow, ladies and gentlemen.